This idea came to me uh, in September 2015 when I purchased some old watches at a car boot sale and took them apart. This process needs good eyesight, or in my case, myopia. First step is to choose an image, and this is my own photo, and then I choose the stained glass substrate and cut it to size. I transfer the image using good old low-tech carbon paper, or if the glass is translucent, I work with the image behind it. The braddle provides a good line image and it's quite precise, but a fine nibbed pen can work fine as well. As you can see, it's quite a faint copy as I don't want it to be visible at the edges of the piece later. I keep the photo handy to refer to the piece as it develops. Um, using tweezers, I use larger solid pieces to begin the image. And I'm using MAC glue from the States as it dries crystal clear and fairly fast. Um, I have quite a range of stock parts now as I buy direct from a local watchmaker and repairer. I like the fact that I'm recycling parts that would otherwise go to be melted down for scrap. Some components are beautifully made, precision tooled items and they never see the light of day once they're inside a clock until I get my hands on them. Now I'm looking for brass pieces for the breast and silver pieces for the rest of the bird. I don't always work in this two-tone colour scheme, but it can be useful with some subjects. The first pieces I made were imaginary birds, but I became more interested in representing animals faithfully, and the ability to capture a silhouette is key to the process. I'm building bulk into the image now, and I want a good 3D effect so it stands out in a box frame. You can see from the glue that it's still milky and wet in the centre of this piece at the stage, so I'll leave it to dry and work on another piece. You can see I'm building up layers and I'm using some more solid parts to give it the required texture. It's at this point that I risk losing sight of the detail beneath, so it's important to refer to the original image more often. I will have rested this piece several times by this stage to let the glue dry. I'm concentrating on a plump shape now and I need to build up with lots of small pieces and work evenly across the piece at this stage. It's important to overlap evenly at the edges of the image to give a smooth line. While it dries, I sort through my stock to find the right pieces to represent the beak as this can really affect the success of the likeness. I've laid the foundation for the beak here and I'm starting to build the legs. I use winder spindles and the long screws which hold watch cases together for them and the tiny spindles from smaller cogs for the fine de detail like the claws. I find myself referring to the original image now as it's difficult to believe how thin a robin's legs are. One of the most important elements of the success of this piece is the eye. It's got to be just the right size and a perfect black shiny ball. And I achieved this by fusing black glass pieces in a microwave kiln. These kilns are not easy to regulate, so they're not good for complicated pieces, but they are perfect for making eyeballs. I'm taking the picture at an angle to show the depth I'm creating and also the lovely ripple of the glass substrate. I'm very lucky that I have a stained glass supplier nearby and I find choosing glass quite an inspirational process. This piece looks like a rolling lawn to me. Now I've created the beak. I've used the hands of an alarm clock and nipped them down to size. The tiniest claws are added using the smallest spindles from cogs and I'm still infilling to cover any obvious holes and give a nice balance. I've used larger parts for the tail and the wing for definition. I've used flash for this image to show the lovely quality of the watch parts. As I build up the layers, I choose the most polished pieces to go at the top. The parts I buy vary in condition and often the brass pieces have a patina. I don't often take time pieces apart myself now, but occasionally I'm given complete watches and clocks to dismantle. It's great fun. On that note, I received some timely advice from an expert about the danger of releasing the springs, especially on large timepieces. 
with some unnecessarily gory descriptions of what can go wrong, which I won't share with you. Now I've come to the point where I'm happy with it, so I add my signature fused glass V. It's a useful device to get around the perennial problem of signing mosaics. This is one of the early birds I mentioned. It's mounted on clear glass with stained glass behind. I used watch springs and hands for the tail, and I didn't layer up as much as in later pieces. I made several of these, one on mirror, which is a dusting nightmare. Uh, this roe deer is in a gallery, and when I delivered uh, a range of pieces for the owner to choose from, he went exclusively, exclusively for the traditional natural subjects. I've done a range of mythical creatures as well, unicorns, dragons, etc., and he was absolutely adamant that he wouldn't be able to interest any of the good folk of Wells in anything like that. This, on the other hand, was perfect for a gallery in Whitby just in time for the goth weekend. The glass for this is gorgeous and I'm always drawn to reds. So I've got huge amounts of it in my studio. The larger leg spindles are from the cogs of a large wall clock and I have spent a happy afternoon bashing them out with a hammer. With this stag beetle, I've separated the colours again to give de definition to the wing cases. I'm always looking for new ideas and when I started making these last year I did an extensive web search and found that there are people using cogs in conventional mosaics like Laura Harris um, with her bicycle gears and a few people making small 3D sculptures but I'm happy that I have an original idea here. These little cats were part of a series, they're each about four centimetres long and use the tiniest cogs. Cats are always popular as are hares and dogs. And if you've produced some themed work, it's always worth checking on Facebook groups that may be interested in it. Uh, this one is one of the mythical pieces which I couldn't interest the Wells Gallery in, but it will, however, be, perfect, be a perfect fit in Whitby, I suspect. Um, the mane and tail are made from copper wire, which came from an electric pendulum mechanism. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you've been inspired to look for some new and unusual materials to spice up your mosaics. Okay, hello, and um, I'd just like to thank Bam for inviting me here to talk about my work. Um, my work explores um, a delicate manipulation of metal that mimics the pencil line. This allows me to find thematically inspired forms while retaining the fluidity of the line creating height and depth. This does not define all of my work, but it has encouraged my desire to bring multi-layered dimensions to it. This is where I started, um, creating a flat mosaic um, and keeping my uh, inspiration or my, my training as a ceramist, ceramicist um, in making some di three-dimensional mosaics as well. But it wasn't uh, enough. It wasn't giving me what I wanted out of mosaic art. Um, uh, through looking at environment of where I lived, um, we had the industrial landscape um, of South Wales pushing through um, uh, nature. Um, I decided to see if I could bring and fuse the two together, so I'd, I discovered lead. And I used the lead, as I said, um, to follow the pencil line, um, creating very fluid, fluid forms. Um, it also allowed me to play around with the ideas of um, having using the negative space uh, just as creatively as the positive uh, space. Um, it also allowed me to, um, as it explains here, um, as well as experimenting with the, the lead. This is about sort of, uh, 15 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, and using the lead in itself to create spirals, to create textures that you could see through. So it was uh, slowly building up this concept of multi-layered um, work. As I got more confident with handling the lead, um, I was able to create uh, these more complex forms, um, very much a sort of dressmaker skills in a sense. Um, it becomes very fiddly, as anyone on my course tomorrow will soon find out. Um, but um, it was just fascinating for me to bring all these industrial materials together, um, creating very delicate um, organic forms. Um, sometimes it's just the subtlety of that extra little bit of a height, which sometimes of only is like a centimetre in this. Uh, just that, uh, creating that shadow 
um, I find very, very intriguing um, and just sets itself slightly differently um, to some other mosaics. Um, again, experimenting with um, some famous masters, uh, Hundavasa, um, and just allowing to be me to be free with the, the, the methodology of it um, and not worrying too much about design and the pressures of my design. Um, and uh, to me, it, it reminds me of uh, playing as a kid back in the rock pools, imagining yourself this big in environments. Um, it's also very good for community-based work. Um, um, it, it allows you to work on the principle of colour by numbers with mosaic. You've got your fixed form, so you know your definition of line is going to be very clear. So it can allow for the, uh, the skills of people to um, not be quite so good, but you've still got the, that clear definition. This was a school project. Um, so you've got the pencil line that's now got the lead um, forming the boundary, um, and then slowly it gets filled in until you get the finished piece, which is fine to get um, embedded into the ground, uh, especially if the tiles are either side of the lead, it's, it sandwiches it in. Uh, also, it allows for great fun in construction, getting the boys involved, um, playing with the heights, as you can see there, um, building. It's, it's uh, a new dimension um, to, uh, to play with, uh, very much playful. Uh, so this is in the workshop, um, exploring uh, how I can play with exaggerating those heights with, uh, with my work. Um, a lot of time I have to work with a blacksmith as well um, to get the desired effect. Um, but you can see the sketches um, and then how I'll slowly bring elements of metal. Um, I've started using resin uh, as well, um, just to really play with what you can do with the layers um, and the meaning that you can then filter into the pieces of work. Uh, I like people to feel like they can get close up and explore all the way around the piece. Um, also, the process works in three dimensions, um, bending around forms. Um, this was a series of pieces that I did about environment and how environment can latch onto you and come out in various forms. So I did a series of fascinators. Um, Another one which had a saw blade as a fascinator as well. My materials, there's a lot of them. Anyone do my workshop tomorrow will see me walk in with a big bag of stuff. This was what I took to Chile um, for the first international mosaic intervention over there. It weighed a ton. <laughs> um, and, um, but just sort of uh, shows the, the, yeah, what you can do, what you can use. Now, this was a, brought on a whole new problem to the way that I work, because usually I'm using the, weight, the leg to, to keep it to the fixed position. Uh, and um, now I had to work against gravity. <laughs> um, so lots of nails holding it up and tape. And, but um, with this photo, unfortunately, you can't see it, but some of these are sort of uh, sticking out by about 10 centimetres in relief um, and really bend and curve um, as they're, they're fitted in. So you get a sense of, a real sense of movement into the piece, um, which uh, I think is very intriguing and uh, people say is very alluring um, as well. So these are a few commissions pieces. Um, again, these are all about 10 centimetres probably. Um, unfortunately, you can't see it too well, but that shovel really sticks out. Um, and just, uh, again, that subtlety, it depends where you use it, you know, it's not necessarily all over the piece, but just, again, that casting a shadow, um, again, in this piece, you can see that there's just that very slight shadow of about a centimetre or so um, that just highlights uh, the main form of the piece, also around the stained glass as well, so it's probably mimicking where the inspiration came from with the stained glass. Um, and this is probably one of my sort of like feature pieces, the uh, most complicated of pieces uh, that I have made. Um, but it, it comes from a ceiling rose, um, but I see it more of a landscape of a garden, a waterfall feature, where you could sit and nestle in amongst it all. So that's my process. Thank you very much. <laughs>